In this video, we're going to be talking about the number one heat pump sizing mistake that you do not want to make. So make sure you stick around for the whole video because we're gonna talk about a lot of common caveats and mistakes that a lot of contractors make, especially contractors that aren't familiar with heat pump sizing. So you wanna make sure that you're sizing this system properly for your home. And at the end of this video, we'll make sure to link a few other videos about how to pick up the best heat pump for your home, as well as some of our other favorite heat pumps on the market, like the Daikin Fit Enhanced, which came out recently as of this year and qualifies for the cold climate uh, tax credit, but more on that later. And if you're tuning into this channel for the first time, make sure you smash that like button and consider subscribing to the channel if you find this content helpful. We put out daily and weekly content on how you can get the best HVAC for your home. So if that's the kind of thing that floats your boat, subscribing is a great way to stay up to date every time we drop a new video. Now the number one heat pump sizing mistake that most people make, as you can tell by the thumbnail, is that they oversize the system. Now they don't oversize the system intentionally thinking that, oh, the heat load calculation calls for 60,000 BTUs Therefore, I better put in a five ton heat pump to keep up. They oversize the system for the load of the house and the constraints of the ductwork. And we'll talk about how you should size a heat pump because if you're trying to size a heat pump to the heating load of the house, although you might think, yeah, that makes like sense. You want a heat pump that can keep up with the load of the house. That's actually not the case because when you're doing a heat load calculation, you're sizing for the lowest or the coldest possible night. And if you put in a system that is sized for the heat load, especially in cold climates, it's actually not going to keep up most of the time and it's not even going to work properly. And I'll also explain why what might be counterintuitive, but the real way that you're supposed to size a heat pump is actually for the cooling load. Now that's because a heat pump is just an air conditioner with a reversing valve. So when a heat pump is running, it is simply reversing the flow of refrigerant. And instead of sending the heat inside, like it does in heat pump mode, it will be sending the heat outside in air conditioning mode. And that's done via a reversing valve and defrost control board, which are two components that are in your outdoor unit aka your condenser. And that's the only thing that differentiates a heat pump between an air conditioner and the reason that you size your heat pump for the cooling load and not the heating load is because it oftentimes, especially in cold climates, your cooling load is actually going to be substantially lower than your heating load. Now, this isn't gonna be, the opposite is going to be true in, in climates like Phoenix, for example. The heating load in Phoenix, even in you know the dead of winter, it's pretty nice there. People are golfing in the dead of winter in Phoenix. And so it's not the same as the dead of winter in Wisconsin, where it might be freezing cold outside. But the reason you're sizing for the cooling load across the board, even in a cold climate, is that oftentimes the constraints of the ductwork are sized for cooling, not sized for heating. And the way that a heat pump works is because you're still using the refrigeration cycle. If you are heating, you need the same amount of airflow that you would need for the same tonnage of cooling. So for example, if you needed, let's say 1400 CFM of airflow for a four ton system of cooling. And that's a minimum of 350 CFM per ton. Ideally, they teach you to do somewhere around 400 or even more like 425 or 450 CFM per ton. But it's rare that we see a big enough ductwork for that. What happens is that if you need 1400 CFM for cooling with a heat pump or an air conditioner, that means you also need 1400 CFM of airflow for heating in heat pump mode because you're using the thermodynamic cycle and you're not using a combustion chamber, the airflow requirements of a furnace are actually much less than that of a heat pump. So that's why you're always gonna be sizing, or that's part one of why you're always gonna be sizing for the cooling load, not the heating load. Now, the reason that this causes problems in the summer, and just to kind of spell this out, is like, let's say the heating load on your house is 60,000 BTUs on the coldest night of the year. And typically when a heat load calculation is done, for example, even though our average low temperature in Colorado is 21 degrees Fahrenheit in the Denver metropolitan area, that's in our coldest month, that's in January. You can look this up online and it tells you what the average lows are for a given month. In January, it's around 21 degrees Fahrenheit. We have nights that are warmer than that. We have nights that are colder than that. But on average, that's the low. Sometimes we get temperatures that are as cold as zero degrees Fahrenheit 
or negative 10 degrees. So the load calculation when you're performing a load calc is actually always based on a much lower temperature. So when we do a heat load calculation in Denver, for example, the low temperature that we're calculating for might be zero degrees Fahrenheit if we're in Denver Metro, or it might be negative 10 or negative 15 degrees if we're in the foothills because it's going to vary depending on where we are uh, doing the heat load calculation. And that's going to affect the heating load and the heating demands of the system. Now, that being said, if we designed the system for 21 degrees Fahrenheit, the demands would be drastically lower because the load on the space in terms of the heating demands are going to be much lower on just that 20 degree difference in terms of temperature. And so it's going to be a lot easier to keep that home warm. And so even though we might put in a three ton heat pump or a four ton heat pump into a house that used to have a furnace that was 100,000 or 120,000 BTUs, oftentimes what happens is you're then stuck in a situation. What happens is that that system is still actually functioning properly. A lot of these systems, when we install them, let's say we're, like I said, replacing a 100,000 BTU furnace with a four ton heat pump because that's the load for cooling. 99% of the time, that four ton heat pump is going to keep up just fine because it's going to be modulating up and down. Most of the heat pumps that we install are cold climate heat pumps and therefore they're inverters, which means like the Dyke and Fit Enhance, that's the number one heat pump that we install in Colorado, but it's going to keep up on those coldest nights. When it first kicks on, it might only be putting out 5,000 BTUs of heat, even though its max capacity is at 48,000 BTUs of heating capacity, which is sub still substantially lower than that furnace. But this is why two-stage furnaces or modulating furnaces actually help solve the problem because when you have a system that's sized with a 100,000 BTU furnace, the truth is even if that's a 96% efficient furnace, which means that the output would be 96,000 BTUs, in Denver and especially higher up in the mountains, you actually have to derate per thousand foot of output altitude above sea level. And so that is something that you have to account for in Denver, which means the output on a lot of these systems is already derated, sometimes 20 or 30 or even 40%. We've installed systems, for example, at 9,000 feet elevation that were at 9,000 feet. They were derated close to 40% from their sea level capacity because the loss in terms of combustion efficiency, once you get above 7,000 or 8,000 feet, depending on the manufacturer specifications in the manual, it starts to derate at a much higher percentage and ratio than it did from, let's say, zero to 5,000 feet. And so that's something that you have to take into account because you might be looking at your old furnace, which by the way, is probably oversized too. That's the most common HVAC sizing mistake in general, not just with heat pumps. And that system was probably sized improperly in the first place. And the best thing that you can do on this note, if you're wondering, if you're if you're concerned about whether or not your system's keeping up, rather than putting in a bigger system, you could just do a better job of insulating your home. The cheapest way to do this is blow in insulation in your attic. Blow in insulation by far is the best bang for your buck investment that you can make in terms of energy efficiency, savings, and just making your home more comfortable because you're going to have less hot spots, less cold spots, and less draftiness throughout the home because you're not losing heat at the same rate. So if you're really looking to maximize efficiency of your home, doing things like siding, windows and insulations to create a tighter envelope for your home is going to do wonders versus putting in a little bit bigger heat pump just so you have better capacity. Because the truth is, is that rather than having a higher capacity, I would always prefer to have a lower capacity system with a better insulated home because then it's going to be cheaper to run the system. And it's actually going to be quieter and more comfortable as well because a smaller system requires less airflow and requires less energy when it's running. Now, the number one problem with oversized systems is going to be that you're gonna have airflow issues. And I mentioned this earlier, but airflow issues can do a couple things. One, it's gonna cause a lot of premature wear and tear on your system. That means that your system is gonna wear out. You're not gonna get the full 20 year life expectancy or 15 or 10 year life expectancy, depending on what region you're in. The life expectancy of your HVAC is going to vary. Typically, it's actually in climates like Houston or, or places by the coast where you actually have an air conditioner or a heat pump that runs like 9, 10, 11 months out of the year. And in those climates, they tend to go through their HVAC systems quicker than we do in Denver. For example, in Denver, we typically have about a 20 year replacement cycle is what we tell people. And that's going to vary depending on how well you take care of it. But premature wear and tear is the number one side effect of a system that's oversized. Number two is it's just not going to work properly. So what's going to happen? 
happen if you have an inverter system is it's going to have a lot of air codes that pop up. For example, on the Daikin Fit, it's a notorious air code of B3, and this has to do with high static pressure. And we run into this when a system is oversized for the ductwork. Unfortunately, there's a lot of undersized ductwork in the first place in Denver. So one of the things that we do when we're doing a bid is we always look, do we need to make modifications to the ductwork to make the system work properly when we're installing it? Because if we do, that's going to reduce wear and tear. It's going to make the home more comfortable. And it's also going to make sure that your system lasts a little bit longer than it would if we just tried to do a straight swap without modifying or fixing the underlying systemic issues that are causing problems with your current HVAC. And another thing that happens when you have an oversized system is what's called short cycling. Now, if you have an air conditioning system currently, you know what short cycling is if your system's oversized. This means your system comes on for five minutes, blasts on, it gets really cold, and then shuts off. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh wow, this is working great because it comes on and then it shuts off really quick. But the opposite is actually true because it's causing more wear and tear on your system because most of the wear and tear occurs when you first kick on the system and, and shut it off. And so if a system is short cycling like that, it's actually very bad for it. And it just causes a lot of premature wear and tear, unnecessary wear and tear. And that's what causes everything from cracks and heat exchangers, seized compressors after five years where things are just, you know, and, and that will happen anyways, just sometimes with systems being under warranty, you know, you're gonna have, we've had to replace compressors under warranty before when there was nothing wrong with the system or system design. But if you have an oversized system, it's almost guaranteed to happen. And and it just exasperates the problem and makes everything worse. And this is why it's so important to get a system that is sized properly for the home. This is why we include a heat load calculation on every installation to make sure that we're getting something that's sized properly for your cooling load, not your heating load. And then the thing is, is and like I said, I, I'm gonna address one of your concerns because you might be watching this thinking, yeah, but if my heat pump isn't sized for the heating load, how is it gonna keep up in the winter? The truth is, is it is sized for the heating load 99% of the time. It's just on those ultra cold nights that it's not keeping up and that's when your backup heat kick kicks in and you're either going to have a backup furnace which is the case with dual fuel applications, or you're going to have a backup electric heat kit and a backup electric heat kit will be able to satisfy the temperatures on those cold nights. So you don't have problems, you still have heat, you're none the wiser. You might notice a little bit of a difference in the comfort of the heat, because if you have an electric heat kit or a furnace, it's actually a little bit drier heat than a heat pump, in my opinion. And that's just something that I've noticed. But the bottom line is that your system will still keep up and that's what that backup heat kit is for. And if you're not in a cold climate and you're in a place like Phoenix or something, you maybe don't need backup heat because in the next day when the sun comes out, it'll be back up to 60 degrees. So a lot of homes that we see in Phoenix, they actually don't have a backup electric heat kit there because it's just really not needed. It's not critical because you're never gonna get frozen pipes in a place that doesn't have temperatures that drop below freezing. So this is why sizing the system. So in summary, the biggest reasons you wanna do this is it's if you oversize the system, it's going to be inefficient, it's going to be uncomfortable, and which means you're not gonna really get to enjoy it in this investment that is oftentimes a, a major investment for people to get new HVAC or to get a heat pump. You'll end up with buyer's remorse because you got the wrong size system for your home. And this is why we offer a sizing guarantee on all of our system installations, because if we put in the wrong size system and we don't catch that before installation, we'll rip it out and we'll put in the right size system. And we do that because we wanna give people what they paid for. And also there's no way to really fix a system that's oversized other than just putting in the right size equipment. And so we've learned to just, we do a good job training our guys on how to size things and how to pick out the right size system for a home, how to do a heat load calculation and how to size the ductwork to make sure that we have enough airflow for everything to work properly. And if you happen to be in one of the areas we service like Denver, Colorado or Phoenix, Arizona, you can actually schedule an appointment with us for free. We come out for free for all first time customers, whether that's for a service call or annual maintenance, or if you're just looking for an estimate for system replacement. And there's actually a link in the description below where you can actually schedule online at your convenience, as well as an up-to-date list of the cities and states that we service. So you can stay up to date when we start servicing your Metro. And if you're tuning into the channel for the first time and you haven't done so already, please make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. It's a free way that you can show your support and is much appreciated. We put out daily and weekly content and how you can stay up to date on the latest HVAC trends. So subscribing is a way that you can stay up to date on those videos as they come out. And as mentioned earlier, there's a few videos popping up on the screen right now. So make sure you check those out if you haven't done so already, and we will catch you on the next episode.